Okay, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Hong Kong U Library, main library. Thank you. Um, we are very privileged that for our first book talk of 2014, we have um, two very good friends, actually, of the Hong Kong U Library and of Hong Kong U generally. Um, they share a common surname, and I won't explain why. I'll leave that to our moderator, who is Gillian Beckley. And um, she will do the introduction to our author and speaker for the evening um, to talk about the book Steps to Paradise and Beyond. So please welcome Dr. Gillian Bickley. Thank you very much, Peter. I wasn't actually going to explain why we have the same surname. <laughs> we can leave that as a mystery. So thank you very much for coming on a very cold evening. We look forward later to any questions you may have. But first, it's my responsibility to introduce Dr. Werner Bickley. He's lived in Asian and Pacific countries for over 50 years, enjoying a long and distinguished career of service in Singapore, Burma, Indonesia, Japan, Hawaii, Saudi Arabia, and Hong Kong, including influential and path-breaking work on behalf of the British Council, the US federally funded East-West Center housed at the University of Hawaii, and what was then the Education Department in Hong Kong. In his work at the East-West Center in particular, he was at the forefront of a pioneering effort to embrace cross-disciplinary knowledge on the cutting edge of what subsequently became the Pacific Rim in academic and wider discourse. In Hong Kong, he was first director of the Institute of Language and Education, now incorporated in the Hong Kong Institute of Education, and contributed much to the understanding of that popular topic, the standard of English in Hong Kong. Steps to Paradise and Beyond, the second volume of Dr. Werner Bickley's autobiography, describes some of his fascinating experiences, and although we have the same surname, I was not part of those experiences because I met Dr. Bickley in Hong Kong. Right? Um, so he tells us some of his fascinating experiences and cross-cultural insights derived from his work and travels in many Asian and Pacific countries, incl yes. <laughs> including his official visit to China in November 1979 and his experiences in South Korea just before the assassination of President Park Chung-hee father of the present president. He writes briefly about President Obama's mother as an East-West Center grantee during Werner's time as director of the East-West Center Culture Learning in Institute and President Obama's own education in Hawaii. Werner concludes with a brief description of how the Institute of Language and Education was set up in the early 1980s by the Hong Kong government to raise substantially the professional standards of English and Chinese in the schools in Hong Kong. In an advanced review of Steps to Paradise and Beyond, Dr. Stuart Christie, professor at Hong Kong Baptist University wrote, Bickley's tools are ideological. His interest is persuasion which can and does conquer. Like most civil servants of the mold, he did what he could to learn the local languages, many different countries, while remaining steadfast in his own use of the English language and culture as exemplars, believed in what he was doing and did his best to do it. His generosity is remarkable. Indeed, the parcel of otherwise noble and sometimes roguish characters that made up the Western colonization of the Pacific give way to the kind of enlightened civility 
Bickley embodies best. He too ranks among that tradition, albeit towards the rear of the parade, extending into our own time. It's entirely to the credit of the writer that he succeeds in making the fag end of colonialism appear not only inevitable, but likable. And in his preface, Charles E. Morrison, president of the East-West Center, Hawaii, writes, at the Cultural Learning Institute, Dr. Bickley impressed me as a man of abiding commitment, great warmth, impeccable integrity, and deep intellect. So it was with both enjoyment and nostalgia that I read Steps to Paradise. The world that Dr. Bickley describes in his account has changed in many ways. This is most obviously true of the rapidly growing economies of Asia, where Beijing or Shanghai streets dominated by bicycles remains only a distant memory. Dr. Bickley's book should remind us that the present emerges out of the past and that much of what we do today takes for granted, much of what we today take for granted about our world derives from the ingenuity, labor, and persistence of those who came before. Um, now, the topic is, is culture, opportunities for culture learning. And Werner has written widely on those topics, including in relation to language teaching and learning. Some examples of the books have the word culture in them. One you may be interested in, a proposal for wise use of ocean resources, a Pacific perspective, a technical report for the OECD Center for Educational Research and Innovation, cultural relations in the global community, many articles and book chapters published in Hawaii, Hong Kong, India, Japan, USA, with titles like Cultural Aspects of Language Imposition in Malay, Singapore, and Indonesia. So Verne has written and co-written English language textbooks. And of course, you have to have cultural knowledge to write textbooks because you're writing for specific groups of people. Um, so there's been a tremendous output for a person who was a full-time administrator and academic leader. He also gave radio talks, made TV appearances, and wrote radio and t t TV programs. Fern is now retired from salaried employment, though hands-on chairman of an educational charity in Hong Kong. He's produced two volumes of autobiography, Footfalls Echo in the Memory, and following the footfalls, Steps in Paradise and Beyond. In these, Werner narrates and reflects on the culture, learning experiences he has enjoyed. So, Werner, please now come and talk about the second volume of your autobiography, Steps to Paradise. Thank you very much. I've got this here. Oh. Can you use that or this? Uh, this is okay. okay. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Well, first, uh, let me thank the university, uh, in particular the librarian, Mr. Peter uh, Sidoku, for giving me the opportunity to speak to you this evening. It's, it's a great pleasure to be in this splendid world of books and to have the opportunity of introducing you to my own new book, Steps to Paradise and Beyond, the second volume of my memoirs. I've entitled my talk, Opportunities for Culture Learning, and I'll describe some of the opportunities for culture learning that I've been fortunate to experience. You may wish to review your own cultural learning experiences in a similar way. My first encounter with Asian cultures and Pacific cultures took place when I was 19 years old and a cipher officer in Britain's Royal Navy, serving first in India and then it was what was then named 
Ceylon. As I've noted in my first book, first autobiography, Footfalls Echo in the Memory, it was a very interesting time to be in Asia, with India on the fringe of independence and partition, and Ceylon not far behind. Following my first arrival in India, I was stationed in Bombay, now Mumbai, at a British naval establishment named HMS Braganza. The names Bombay and Braganza are interesting. Bombay came to Britain in 1662, not as a result of conquest, but as part of the dowry brought by the Portuguese princess Catherine of Braganza to the Stuart King of England, Charles II. The dowry also included the Moroccan seaport, Tangier, two million Portuguese crowns, and access to trade routes in the East Indies and Brazil. That was a very good deal. Anyway, Britain abandoned Tangier 22 years later in favor of the Sultan of Morocco. I joined the British Navy in 1944. I can hardly believe that it was that long ago. 1944. And two and a half years later, I became a civilian again and returned to second year studies at the university. I had completed the first year in 1944 under what was called the Y scheme, the Y standing presumably for youth. You spent six months at a university, half your time was taken up with naval training and the other half with academic work. Well, after demobilization and completing my university education back in Britain, I was fortunate, fortunate enough to be accepted by the then British Colonial Office as an education officer in Singapore, attached to Mr. Lee Kuan Yew's alma mater, Raffles Institution Secondary School. After two and a half years at Raffles, I was transferred to the Singapore Teachers Training College, where I became head of the Department of English and Speech Training, remaining in that position until my appointment to the British Council in 1959. All this does seem a very long time ago. I served the British Council uh, for 12 years in Burma, Indonesia, and latterly as a first secretary in the British Embassy in Tokyo, until in 1971 I was offered and found it difficult to refuse and accepted the appointment to head a new institute, the Culture Learning Institute, at the US federally funded East-West Center in Honolulu. How could one turn that down? Thank you. The center was founded by the US Congress in 1960. And although I didn't join the center until 1971, I heard about it first in 1960 when, as I mentioned in my book, Steps to Paradise and Beyond, I represented the British Council at a planning meeting in Rangoon, together with five senior faculty members of the University of Hawaii and officials from the United States Embassy. On the 9th of June, 1959, the then Senator Lyndon Johnson introduced a bill to establish an educational center in Hawaii to provide for cultural and technical interchange between East and West. The center was to do this through programs of education, training, and research. I think that it's fair to say that over the last 50 years, it has been reasonably successful in fulfilling the ambitious goals 
set for it by the Senate and the House of Representatives. There is an interesting connection between the British sailor, Captain James Cook, and the Hawaiian Islands, named the Sandwich Islands by Cook, uh, after his mentor, the fourth Earl of Sandwich. The Earl's title derived from Sandwich, an historic town situated on the River Stour in England. It is said that the Earl had come up with the idea of joining two pieces of bread and a filling so that he could eat while playing round the clock at a gambling table. Uh, no doubt he would have been doing that today in Macau. Hence, the sandwich was created. When he wasn't gambling, the Earl had duties as the first Lord of the British Admiralty, and in that capacity sent Cook sealed orders to search for a northwest passage, a route through the South Arctic Ocean, uh, the South Arctic Ocean Arctic Archipelago, northern Canada, and along the north coast of Alaska. Cook's orders read, The Earl of Sandwich has signified to us His Majesty's pleasure that an attempt should be made to find out a northern passage by sea from the Pacific to the Atlantic Ocean. Well, unfortunately, Cook was unable to carry out his mission successfully, and the discovery would have to wait until 1851, when Sir Robert McClure and his crew discovered and transited a passage over the ice barrier by ship and sledge. Captain Cook was killed, murdered, in Hawaii on Sunday, the 14th of February, 1779, some 235 years ago. His two ships, Resolution and Discovery, had arrived at the Hawaiian Islands on the 16th of January, 1778. Cook reported in his log that at first only a few of the natives visited the ship, but as he put it, towards noon we had the company of a good many, no fewer than a thousand. They brought with them breadfruit, potatoes, taro, a few plantains, and some small pigs. From the moment that he landed, Cook was treated with great respect, and in the evening of the 17th of January, he and a crew member, a Mr. Bailey, were received by four men who carried wands uh, decorated with dog's hair, and, to quote, marched before us, pronouncing with a loud voice a short sentence in which we could only distinguish the word Orono, Orono, and which seemed to be applied to Cook. Cook was, in other words, being treated with the veneration that would have applied to a god. A detailed account of the days before and after the landing of Cook's ships in the Hawaiian Islands can be read in a splendid account given by Glandur Williams in his book, Captain Cook's Voyages. Williams records that Cook weighed anchor on the 4th of February and suggests that his murder would not have taken place if a gale had not damaged the foremast of resolution so badly that it became necessary to seek shelter as soon as possible. Discovery, the other ship, also needed attention since some of her planks had sprung and she was taking on a great deal of water. 
On the 10th of February, Cook's reappearance in Hawaiian waters to carry out repairs caused consternation among the Hawaiians because it has been said Ku, the god of war, had now taken the place of Lono, the god of fertility. Stones were hurled at Cook's ships and a ship's cutter and the armorer's tools were stolen from the discovery. Quoting Lieutenant James King, Williams noted that Cook landed with an armed party of nine marines and their lieutenants intending to march to the high priest Kalani Opu'u's house to take him hostage until the boat and the tools had been returned. Cook and several of his men were still on the beach when the crowd turned ugly and advanced menacingly towards the landing party. Cook turned to order the other boats to come in and as he did so he was stabbed fatally in the back. In his interesting publication, Traditional Ways of Cultural Management, Malcolm Nai Chun maintains that the first encounter at Nihihau and Kauai of the uh, Hawaiians with the ships led by Cook was far from the romantic image of friendly hordes of natives in canoes and he claims that there is no evidence that the Hawaiians thought these western explorers could be gods. The encounter appears to have been prompted by curiosity and suspicion and to have ended with, training, with trading. Well perhaps that may have been true for the first encounter but it does seem that the Hawaiians were on the whole friendly and Cook noted in his diary that the visitors met no obstruction in watering, gathering water. In fact, the natives assisted Cook's men in rolling casks of water to and from a fresh water pool and helped in other ways. As already mentioned, Cook was honored with the name Orono, Lono, the god of light, peace, and fertility. Chun has taken the view that a vigorous business community might have evolved among native Hawaiians. But this is not, unfortunately, the case. The change seems to have come from trade in the sense of bartering with which the Hawaiians were familiar to a market economy that used money. Chan's tentative solution to this dilemma, which still exists, rests upon the integration of cultural practices into corporate life, the extension of culturally based concepts into corporate culture might work if there were an organization bold and brave enough to take a risk in moving the theory and the model into reality. In 1952, in their monograph Culture, a critical review of concepts and definitions, the American scholars Alfred Kreuber and Clive Cluckhorn compiled a list of 164 definitions of culture. It is up to us to choose from the list the definition with which we are most comfortable. Other scholars maintain that, for example, that culture is that which separates humans from non-humans. Others think of culture as communicable knowledge or the sum of achievements produced by man's social life. Yet others consider culture to be that which binds people together, a way of thinking, a way of feeling, a way of behaving. Many aspects of life help to form a people's values and the generally accepted way of doing things. Often we're tempted 
are determined or at least influenced by the culture in which our lives take place. Keeping appointments, getting married, signing documents, making love, greeting people, rearing children and so on. It is, of course, very easy to generalize and place all thoughts, actions and blame at the door of the concept that we have named culture. I have, for example, heard Americans say of themselves that an American is a person with energy and drive. He, she is strong and self-confident, yet friendly and straightforward in manner. The composite American is sometimes described as awkward, well-meaning, embarrassingly friendly, and most irritating of all, perpetually impatient and possessed of an annoying sense of superiority. Some people interpret American informality as a lack of respect, but respect and informality are not necessarily related. There is little regard for rank, especially socially. High is not meant to be rude. Where do you work? Do you have any children? Do you play golf? Are not, so it is said, personal questions by American standards, but rather a search for common ground upon which to base a conversation. All this is true to some extent, but it is necessary to avoid the sort of overgeneralizations to be found, for example, in the work of Edward Hall, the man who coined the word proxemics. Whilst I was, at first, interested in Hall's studies of the uses made by human beings of space and the various differences in those uses, referred to in his books, no doubt in this splendid library, The Hidden Dimension, 1966, and The Silent Language, 1959, he lost my interest with generalizations such as an Englishman may never have a permanent room of his own. The English are puzzled by the American need for a secure place in which to work. The English, lacking rooms of their own since childhood, never developed the practice of using space as a refuge from others. In England, to phone someone is pushy or rude. The Englishman is fastidious about his clothes and expects to spend a great deal of time and attention to their purchase. In contrast, English women approach the buying of clothes in a manner reminiscent of the American male. I just don't believe that. The Englishman is taught to pay strict attention, to listen carefully. He doesn't nod his head or grunt to let you know that he understands. <laughs> Can't do it. Proper listening behavior includes immobilization of the eyes at social distance so that whichever eye one looks at gives the impression of looking straight at you. In order to accomplish this feat, the Englishman must be eight or more feet away. He is too close when the 12 degree horizontal span of the macula won't permit a steady graze. At less than eight feet, one must look at either one eye or the other. Well, I just don't believe Mr. Hall uh, in those statements. I have to say, however, that he does have a point when he applies his thesis to the French. When a Frenchman talks to you, he says, he really looks at you. And there is no mistaking this fact. On the streets of Paris, he looks at the women he sees very directly. American women, returning to their own country after living in France, often go through a period of self-deprivation. They have grown accustomed to being looked at. 
the American habit of not looking makes them feel as if they didn't exist. Well, Steps to Paradise and Beyond makes no attempt to follow Hall's path and generalize about a particular culture or cultures and their manifestations. Rather, it focuses on culture learning, defined by my late colleague, Dr. John Walsh, as a process by which individual learners come to know not just a particular fact regarding a culture or even a number of, individual, of different systems of facts, but the general principles in which specific facts of the culture are rooted. Walsh goes further by stating that cultural learning seeks to discover what the people of a given culture feel, believe, value and think, and perhaps more importantly, why they think, feel, believe and value as they do. In his book, the audacity, audacity of Hope, President Barack Obama takes a supportive but somewhat different tack when he acknowledges the power of culture to determine both individual success and social cohesion. I believe, says the President, we ignore cultural factors at our peril. But I also believe that our government can play a role in shaping that culture for the better or for worse. Obama, as I'm sure you may know, was born in Oahu, Hawaii, on the 4th of August, 1961, to Stanley Ann Dunham and Barack Hussein Obama, from Kenya, and he was born at Hawaii's Kapiolani Medical Center for Women and Children. Following her divorce from Barack Hussein, Stanley, Stanley the, the lady, Stanley married an Indonesian, Lolo Soitoro, from whom she was also divorced in 1980. As an East-West Center grantee, she studied anthropology at the University of Hawaii and also participated in the East-West Center's programs in its Technology and Development Institute. In July 1910, 2010 rather, 2010, the East-West Center celebrated its 50th anniversary. Academic papers were read and discussions took place over a wide range of topics. One complete session was devoted to the mother of the newly elected President of the United States, whose half-sister, Maya Soitoro, spoke first, confirming that her mother was both artistic, a potter, and a tough person, who nevertheless was easily moved. On the same platform as Soitoro, Anne Hawkins, a friend of Stanley's, told the audience in a tearful presentation that she first met Stanley when both were volunteer workers in the mountains of central Java. She remembered Stanley as being rather frumpy in her field outfit, sandals, scarf, and glasses. Nancy Cooper spoke next and confirmed that she had worked with Stanley in Java's limestone hills. She noted that her friend deliberately chose a marginal area for inquiry, focusing on cottage industries and the entrepreneurial ambitions of the people working in those industries. These comments and others about a well-respected friend and in some cases have led to the establishment of an endowment named the Anne Dunham Soetoro Endowment Fund 
created in the anthropology department at the University of Hawaii in cooperation with the East-West Center. Anne Dunham was what in airline language is described as a frequent traveler, leaving her son and later daughter to be cared for during her absences from Hawaii by Barak's grandparents. Anne traveled mainly to Indonesia. In contrast, I myself journeyed outside Honolulu on east-west center business, not only to Indonesia, but also to very many other countries in Asia and the Pacific. Two particular visits stand out in my mind. I was reminded of this recently when a public statement was made in South Korea by the president, Ms. Park Jun Hai. She is the daughter of a former president, Park Chung Hee. In October 1979, I visited Seoul, first for a meeting with the former director of the East-West Center's Technology and Development Institute, Professor Han Bin Lee, who was to chair a meeting in Seoul of the Asian Parliamentary Union, at which I gave a keynote address. The second reason for my visit was to interview a scholar named Cho for a research associate position in the Cultural Learning Institute. On the sixth day of my visit, I was invited by Dr. Chun Hua of the Korean International Cultural Society to attend a dinner sponsored by the society. As I note on page 240 of Steps to Paradise, the host was to be Dr. Kim Myung Ho, president of the society. The dinner was timed for 6.30 p.m. I arrived promptly and mingled with the other guests. Seven o'clock came, but Dr. Kim had not arrived. Eight o'clock came, but Dr. Kim had not arrived. By this time, large quantities of rice wine and other drinks had been downed by all present. But where was Dr. Kim? This was most unusual, since, as you well know, in Asia, and indeed often elsewhere, the host makes sure to be present at least 15 minutes before the first guests arrive. Finally, a somewhat disheveled Kim appeared at about 8.30 p.m. After shaking a few hands, he proceeded to do his duty without an explanation for his tardiness. More drinks were poured and consumed before speeches were made. Dinner was served and enjoyed, and I was able to retreat to the Plaza Hotel and stumble into bed. But not for long. At 3.43 in the morning, the telephone rang in my room. I struggled awake and answered it without enthusiasm. It was Professor Cho. You will have to leave Korea, he said. You must take the earliest flight possible. This was a very strange request from a person who only a few hours before had been interviewed for a job. Why? I don't plan to leave until this afternoon. No, 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 said Cho. You must go now, now. It is too dangerous for foreigners. Why? I repeated. I dare not tell you on the telephone, said Cho. I'll come to your hotel in one hour and take you to the airport. Please be ready. Again, I asked why. I can't tell you now. Please believe me. I'll meet you in the lobby. In the lobby. Feeling quite disgruntled and still only half awake, I packed my bag and took the lift down to the cashier's desk where I paid my bill and waited for Professor Cho. He arrived after half an hour in a state of considerable agitation. Let us go now, now. It is crucial that you should leave immediately. You must go. You are in danger. All foreigners are in danger. Why? said I again. 
and with some irritation. Because our president has been assassinated, said Joe, and all foreigners will be under suspicion. President Park Chung-hee had been murdered at 7.45 p.m. in a secret house in the Chong Wa Dai Blue House in that compound. It seems that those responsible were led by the director of the Korean Central Intelligence Agency, Kim jae Kyu. This surely explained why another limb, Dr. Kim Myung-ho, had been late for the dinner at which he was the host. He was clearly a member of the government's inner circle. The second memorable visit took place seven months after the assassination. Six conspirators were found guilty of the murder, five were hanged, and one was executed by firing squad. In 2005, the dramatic events of the 26th of October 1979 in Seoul were revisited in a Korean language film, The President's Last Bang, directed by Im Sang Soo. Well, a bare month after I returned to Hawaii from Korea, I prepared in November 1979 to visit China, together with a colleague of mine, Mr. Larry Smith. At the invitation of the Chinese government, we were invited to visit Beijing, Shanghai, and Guangzhou as guests of the government's education bureau. We felt privileged to receive such an invitation since full diplomatic relations between China and the United States had only been restored 11 months before our visit. During our week-long visit to Beijing, we stayed at the Friendship Hotel, originally built, I believe, to house most, if not all, of the Russian experts who had over a number of years been invited to work in China until their contracts expired. I didn't get off to a very good start in China, I have to say. I'd been in my hotel room for less than two hours when I committed a major gaffe. I picked up a very battered thermos flask from a side table and in the act of unscrewing the lid, I dropped the flask to the floor and the inevitable happened. The glass inside the flask was shattered irrevocably. The room attendant who sat outside, to whom I reported my misdemeanor, was very displeased. He frowned and looked very hostile, and he brought me a replacement with obvious reluctance. I should have felt sorry for him because I didn't realize then that the flask was his personal responsibility and that he might have to pay for a replacement. Well, on the day after our arrival in China, we began an intensive program of visits to higher educational institutions, several of which have now changed their names and their original purposes. In Beijing, they included what was then known as the Beijing Institute of Foreign Languages No. 1, founded as the Foreign Languages Institute. The number four high school in Beijing, where I was asked to give a lecture, mainly about the blind and deaf educationist Helen Keller, and the Foreign Language Institute No. 2, now the Beijing International Studies University. We repeated such visits to institutes of higher education in both Shanghai and Guangzhou. The last of these was the now renamed Guangzhou Institute of Foreign Languages, where I gave a lecture that was recorded and filmed by video camera. I sometimes wonder if 35 years later, after it was made, the film is still in existence at what is now the Guangdong University of Foreign Studies. Larry Smith and I enjoyed our visit to China immensely. We were treated throughout with great courtesy. And before we left Beijing for Shanghai and Guangzhou, we met on several occasions 
with Professor Xu Guo Chang. And after I returned to Hawaii, I was touched to receive a letter from the professor in which he said, and I quote, Yours is the first university delegation to which we feel we have been able to provide sufficient opportunities for you to make independent observations. I realize, as much as you do, that findings must be authentic in order to be valuable. And I sincerely hope that is what you are able to get from your visits to the English Department of Peking Foreign Languages Institute. Well, one of the most satisfying results of our visit was the opportunity I had to visit a scholar named Wu Bing to spend a year at the Cultural Learning Institute as a professional associate. Wu Bing may have been the first in that category to come to the United States from mainland China. A very talented person in her own right, Wu Bing is the daughter of the late well-known and very popular writer of children's stories, Bing Xin She, who began to publish in the 1920s. After graduating from Yanjing University in 1923, Bing Xin journeyed to the United States and was accepted as a student of literature at Wellesley College. She returned to China in 1926 and taught Chinese literature at her alma mater, Yanjing University, until 1936. Yanjing was closed after 1949, and its arts faculty was transferred to Peking University. It is possible that some members of this audience may have come across some of Bing Qing's publications. For example, her letter to young readers and the prose classics, A Smile, A Little Orange Lantern, and Ode to Cherry Blossoms. I'm sure there are copies in this magnificent library. It's also fairly certain that Hang Sun Yin, also an alumnus of Yen Qing, will be known to everyone present here this evening. Four years before my visit to mainland China, on March the 8th, 1975, a replica of a double-hulled voyaging canoe named the Hokulea was launched by the Polynesian Voyaging Society in Hawaii. The Society's aim was to prove that it was possible to sail more than 6,000 nautical miles over the Pacific Ocean from west to east without the support of charts, compasses, or other modern aids to navigation. I was a guest at the launch ceremony and near sacred Hawaiian ritual held at a beach park in Oahu. This was largely because my institute at the center was able to contribute to this pioneering voyage by providing financial support and a fellowship for the navigator, Pius Mao Pialug, and Dr. David Lewis, the assistant navigator, a medical doctor, and a sailor of considerable experience. The voyage of the Hokulea was truly a culture learning institute exercise on an ambitious scale. First, it achieved its goal by proving that very long voyages could take place without the usual navigational aids. And it provided verification of the navigating skills of Pacific Islanders while disproving the theory of Thor Heyerdahl that canoes could only cover long distances from east to west. Second, the voyage was carried out by persons from different cultural backgrounds, Hawaiians, a navigator from a small island in Micronesia, a British explorer of world renown, and a Caucasian American. Third, 
the navigational arts used and taught by Pierre Lug and Lewis were those that eschewed modern methods and equipment. Fourth, the ceremonies that attended the launching of the, vehicle, of the, uh, of the vessel and its arrival in Tahiti were traditional in nature and a cultural learning experience for those to whom they were not familiar. For example, during the launch ceremony, a Hawaiian master chanter spoke to the spirits, asking them to take care of the vessel. Subsequently, a basket containing the bones of a black pig and the remains of a consecrated meal that had earlier been addressed by the crew were thrown overboard. Finally, the canoe was blessed. Unfortunately, this pioneering voyage was marred by the cultural differences exhibited by some of the crew. The problem is there hadn't been enough time completing the building of the boat, practice runs, practice sails. There hadn't been enough time or enough time was not taken to brief the crew on how they should behave. One crew member brought with him a transistor radio, which he concealed until the second day of the journey. That had to go overboard. This could have invalidated the voyage and its attempt to undertake a long ocean crossing without instruments. Second, it was found on the eighth day out that certain members of the crew had brought some marijuana aboard. And third, the original idea that only Polynesian foods would be eaten during the voyage broke down when it was revealed that coffee, tea, liquor, chocolate bars and jam had been smuggled onto the vessel. All these things had to go overboard, which made the leaders very, very unpopular. And in fact, before they arrived at Tahiti, and they did arrive, there was a fist fight between two members of the crew. Well, overall, despite the setbacks, the voyage was a great success. And on May the 30th, 2013, 38 years after it was first launched, the Hokulea sailed the first of a 22-leg journey that will take it to 28 countries over a four-year period. So the Hokulea is still in business all those many years later. In November 1985, I was invited by the German Foundation for International Development, Deutsche Stiftung für Internationale Entwicklung, DSE, to attend a conference on national cultures to be held in Bad Honnef, a small town in the Rhineland, in the Rhineland where the foundation has offices. As I note in my book, many of the details of the Bad Honnef conference have faded from my mind with the passage of time, but I remember very well the contributions of one of the delegates, Dr. Gert Hofstetter, a scholar who is now very well known in intellectual circles worldwide, his books are sure to be in the library. <laughs> Perhaps the most controversial aspect of his work is his suggestion that there are national cultures, that there is an overarching American culture, Indonesian culture, German culture, Chinese culture, and so on. His justification for this claim is based on an analysis collected in a number of questionnaires and subjected to what he has put forward as a sophisticated statistical analysis. Hofstetter's theory contrasts with that put forward by a former Culture Learning Institute research associate, Dr. Richard Brislin, who attracted to the institute well-known scholars in the field of cross-cultural psychology. Several of Richard's publications focus on what he has called critical incidents that without intent perhaps refute Hofstetter's assertion 
that there are national cultures. In fact, Brislin refers specifically to culturally different people within one nation. He describes the purpose of his critical incidents to help people understand and interpret aspects of different cultures through short stories, each of which has characters, a theme, a plot line, and an ending that involves a puzzle or a misunderstanding. The incidents that he has selected focus on adjusting to other persons' cultures. For example, by attempting to understand the ways in which decisions are made, the importance that people may place on social norms, and the development of positive interpersonal relationships. Well, there it is. A few thoughts and accounts of personal experiences relating to culture and how it is viewed, lived and understood. I will finish, to your relief, this evening by quoting from a much neglected book which I can strongly recommend, bound to be in the library, by the late writer John Stuart Collis. Collis decided that in one of his books he had a chance to bring together what he called the fact, the fact, the idea, the process, and the person. Well, the result of that was a minor classic entitled The Worm Forgives the Plow, published in 1973. In my book, I've tried to follow Collis's example by presenting some facts about my life in Hawaii uh, and Saudi Arabia, which I haven't mentioned this evening. I've put forward some ideas about culture learning as we perceived it at the Culture Learning Institute in the 1970s. I have described the processes that we followed and I've referred to the many interesting people who came to the center. Thank you very much for listening so patiently. Thank you very much. Drunk again? <laughs> Must be the water. I'm sure you, you will have questions. Yes, I know. Thank you. So I'm sure you'll have some questions, but I'm going to ask the first question, if I may, which has two parts. So perhaps that's the first two questions, is it? <laughs> um, I hope you can manage to, to keep going for another little bit to answer the question. So, the title of Werner's talk is Opportunities for Culture Learning. And we know that for a number of years, Werner was director of the Culture Learning Institute at the East West Center in Hawaii. And so my question is, please can you tell us who was doing the culture learning? I'll ask you a bit later. Later, I'll ask us. Okay. Uh, say again. You've got a mic. Who was doing the culture learning at the Culture Learning Institute at the East West Centre? Well, one of the uh, rules uh, at the East West Centre was to bring people, uh, students at the master's level and the doctoral level, from all over Asia and the Pacific. I think it got as far as. Uh, uh, fairly deep into Europe, but not too far. And uh, I think the, the, the purpose was to bring people together from these different cultures and to put them in a specially designed floor of a particular building. The floor was designed for maximum interaction. And so you had people from these many, many different countries, many, many different cultures coming together some of them for the first time, to be in a space that could not be changed when they were pretty well forced to speak to other people and to learn something about the cultures 
of those other people. Uh, this was designed by I.M. Pei, and on the whole, it worked very well. There were occasional arguments about cooking, because some people like to cook their particular kind of food, and other people like to cook their particular kind of food. Didn't always quite work out, but on the whole, it was pretty good. So, everyday living, you were, in a sense, uh, living in an intercultural society. You were meeting people from other cultures, you were responding to people from other cultures, and so on. And then when you went to the University of Hawaii, which you did for your master's training or for your PhD, obviously at the university you met again people from other cultural backgrounds. And when you came to the East West Center to participate in its programs, the same kind of thing. So you were immersed in different cultures from the time that you first appeared. When I was there, the grants were very generous indeed. If you were studying for a master's degree for two years, everything paid for, including a field trip to another country, apart from not your own country, but another country. If you were studying for a doctorate, three years, you could spend a year in another country at the East West Center's expense. It was a very expensive operation, but on the whole, it worked very well indeed. Thank you very much. And the follow-up question is, um, you pointed out that the East West Center, of which the Cultural Learning Institute was part, was and still is funded by the federal government of the United States of America. Um, can you please tell us what the motive of the US government was in establishing the East-West Center? Well, it's, these days it's probably uh, partly funded by the uh, US government and the rest of the money comes from grants and donations. So it's not quite uh, the same as it was when the center was first founded in 1960. I think one of the reasons for the uh, founding of the center was 1960, the war in Vietnam was going on. I think the idea was that it would be good to bring people from different countries in an academic setting, but also when they would meet each other and perhaps this would help to gain say what was going on in a most dreadful way uh, in Vietnam. I think that was probably one of the reasons. Another reason was that the governor of Hawaii, whose name was Burns, was very friendly with the then, um, uh, before he became the president, with uh, uh, Lyndon Johnson. And so they got together quite frequently and the idea must have come up, but it was also urged on by people from the University of Hawaii who said, we are in the middle of the ocean, we are an ideal place for this kind of activity to take, to take part. We have the United States, Canada and all the rest on that side, we have the countries of Asia on the other side, this is an ideal place in the middle of the ocean for it to be done. Thank you very much. So now, <laughs> thank you. So now, questions from the floor. Who would like to ask a question of this lady? Uh, Dr. Bakley, uh, you obviously had a very rich experience in different countries and a lot of cultures. But you started that when you were a very young man, actually. So with so many years, would you mind sharing with us, have you or to what extent have you been affected by any of these cultures? And, and, and if there is, what, what type of impact on you? That's a very good question. I, I, I think the answer is that I still remain rooted in, in my own culture. Um, and that has never left. But I have had the opportunity to meet people from other backgrounds and I, that's been very enjoyable and, and uh, I think uh, a very, very good learning experience. But I think that still 
Um, I'm not sure that I will ever go back to Britain, <laughs> but um, nevertheless I think I still have that uh, possibility and um, those roots, which I, I think would be very, very difficult, uh, you know, to, to change. You're brought up by your parents, your parents teach you certain things, you go to school, you go to college or university or whatever it is, and again, the same kind of thing occurs. So I personally have considered that I've enjoyed living in places where the cultures are quite different, but at the same time I think I'm still rooted in my own. I hope you can send me the bibliography <laughs> to verify that we do have all of those books in this great <laughs> library. Um, I, I kind of want to follow up on that, and it's about, I think it's about cultural retention to some extent. And, and, and I think that's difficult for you because you've lived in so many different countries. But, you know, I think about my own experience growing up. I, you know, and I grew up in Australia, and it was very English at the time. Um, and coming back to your comment about the cooking. Now, I rarely cook Western food anymore. And I think that's it's a part of, you know, maybe perhaps a very superficial part, but it's still a part of culture that, that I have retained and, and actually um, feel is superior to that part of my culture that uh, I grew up with. It's probably a comment. But <laughs> Yes, well, um, I've often thought that uh, we should have run a program on cooking because, indeed, as I mentioned, uh, in this building that was custom-built so that people had to interact, cooking was one of the favorite ways of, uh, of interacting. Um, somebody would smell a particular smell and say, oh, that, that smells delicious. What is it? And they would say, oh, it's nasi goreng or something like that. How do you make it? How, let me try. So I think that was very important also. Mm. Sir? Sir? Mm -hmm. You might tell me in the guest who are the strongest? Sorry, who? In the galaxy. In the galaxy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Will you tell me who are the strongest? In the galaxy. In the galaxy. What galaxy? Maybe. Maybe the globe. Uh huh. In the Bible said that or Yan Si Tan Dad Yi Man Lidi Chai Ting Jim Gamale Hoka Bin Tai Sing King Do you come by Ha Fung Yan Wai Kay Day Do you Sang Sun Ta I think it's an irrelevant question. He's saying that um, the most outstanding physicists or scientists, such as Einstein, Darwin, when they face the Bible, they are still, what to say, they have still to adore the Bible. To I mean, yeah, yeah. I think this is yeah. not. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Now, do I have a question. Thank you. I have a question. Um, when you stated that Barack Obama was born in Hawaii, you were very 
strong about that statement, given that some people were questioning his birth <laughs> a few years ago when he was being reelected. I have a copy of his birth certificate. So. <laughs> <laughs> I have a copy of his birth certificate. Really? Yeah. Is it in the book? Is it in the book? Yes, it is in the book. You can apply for people's birth certificates. Yeah. Why did you go to the book? Anywhere. But I, I, I like the fact that you were very, he was born <laughs> in this book. And he visits uh, fairly often, I mean, given the other concerns that he has. Uh, Whenever he has the opportunity, you'll find him there because, of course, his half-sister is there. In fact, she teaches at a college, um, not, not the University of Hawaii, but at another college. And uh, she's quite active and very well respected, I may say. So he is there as often he, as he can be. And, of course, the school that he went to is a superb school. Uh, there are two in Hawaii, two wonderful schools. I won't say anything about the state system, <laughs> not so good. But these two schools, Punahou, uh, I can't remember the name of the other one now, but a church school, are very, very good indeed. So he was very fortunate to go to such a, a very good place, basically to learn his trade in some ways, because he, he gave speeches and all the rest of it as he became more mature. Any questions? I saw that you were paying great attention. Do you have a question? No question. Everybody's too shy. You can ask the question, you know. <laughs> In your book, which I haven't had the pleasure of reading yet, uh, do you deal with your time in Hong Kong? And uh, would you care to share with us a few thoughts on your your role in education in Hong Kong? I did actually have a section towards the end and I deleted it. <laughs> um, I felt, well, for one thing, it was getting far too long as indeed my, uh, my talk was probably far too long. But I did delete it in the end um, because somehow it, it, um, it seemed to me that it would be more interesting to... to uh, write about other countries rather than the place we're living in. Um, I enjoyed my time in Hong Kong. I was the first director of something called the uh, um, Institute of Language and Education, which was set up with the idea um, by Lechko, with the idea that special uh, consideration should be given to the learning and teaching and researching of Chinese and English, that you needed to have an institution that focused on those two languages because they were so very important in, in, in this particular uh, situation, this particular uh, place. Uh, and that was how we operated. And we were, at that time, there were four colleges of education. And then the um, cultural learning, the, not the cultural, the Institute of Language and Education was placed one rung above the colleges, which made things a little bit difficult when I first arrived. Because I had to go to each of the colleges and explain, I'm terribly sorry, but we are one step ahead of you. And you've been here for many, many years, and we're the new people on the block. But uh, on the whole, it worked out quite well uh, in the end. And we were charged to uh, carry out research into language learning and teaching to carry out research into the best ways of training teachers in their schools and out of their schools. Uh, we were encouraged to publish as much as possible, and so on. So in, in a sense, it was a very, very interesting uh, brief. And uh, one of the first things we did was to get government permission to run a major conference. I may tell you that this... Perhaps it was the novelty. Uh, no one <laughs> had ever asked before for money from the government to run an international conference. So it went through very quickly. And we held something like, before I uh, retired, 
something like five or six of these annual conferences. Um, I think it got about number seven or number eight, and then they stopped. Uh, perhaps the money ran out. But that was quite exciting, to be able to bring experts from many, many different countries, many different backgrounds, and we published the results. So we, if, if you're interested, and I'm sure in this library, <laughs> we, 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 have, we have copies of the books. Um, the only problem with it, perhaps, was that when the teachers went back into their schools after their six months at the uh, institute, they were caught up again in the business of the school. So you were never quite certain that they were able to put into practice some of the ideas that they had uh, learned and discussed and so on uh, at, the, uh, at the institute. We started off in Yamate uh, on the top two floors of a building. Very crowded indeed. We have photographs of, uh, of the staff trying to sleep at lunchtime. And very, very crowded. Uh, uh, and still, even then, we managed to run exhibitions and so on. We had a murder one day. We were all uh, told, uh, in no uncertain terms, stay in your rooms. Do not come below the second floor, whatever it is, because somebody's been shot. So it's quite interesting. Nokia now operates uh, in that building. I don't know whether there's any connection. But, um, <laughs> Um, and then in the end, um, after a lot of lobbying and the support, the great support of the Director of Education at that time, uh, we got our own building. And this was by taking a building on one level and another building on a higher level and constructing a, a way of moving between the two. Very, very interesting. But then, of course, um, it was decided that the new institute would take on the role of, uh, that had been uh, served by the Cultural Learning Institute, by the uh, Institute of ILE, the ILE. Which I think is a pity, because I think that still that Chinese and English deserve special treatment. And uh, I don't know if members of the uh, EXCO of that time who voted for it realized what happened to their baby, because their baby was starved to death. <laughs> I think there are no more questions. If I'm wrong, put up your hand very quickly. So thank you very much, Werner. Thank you very much again to the library. Thank you. Thank you so much. We just have, we just have a small souvenir for our, our speakers. Um, this is the Hong Kong Heritage Calendar, uh, sponsored by the University of Hong Kong Libraries. All the images that in here, taken from the 60s, are taken from our collection. Um, so very historic photos. So thank you. Thank you very much. There's one each there. <laughs> and this is something else that is less interesting, but more bulky. <laughs> so thank you again. It was very great pleasure to have you both again. Thank you. As I said at the beginning, very good friends of the Hong Kong U and especially the Hong Kong U Library. Our next book talk is on the 6th of March. It's Professor... Uh, uh, Doug, who is it? Uh, Doug. Yeah, exactly. I, I should know. Um, sorry. Douglas Kerr. He'll be talking about his new book, Conan Doyle, and it's uh, going to be a very good night. So thanks for coming, everybody, in a cold evening. Thank you.